Hey, Eastside family. We are so glad you're joining us this morning for church. If you are a first time guest, we want to welcome you to our Eastside family. Connect with us by sending an email to newguest at ebcnet.org. If you're looking for different ways to connect at Eastside, we want to encourage you to check out a life group. Go to followeastside.com slash life groups to see a complete list of classes being offered. There's something for everyone. Speaking of something for everyone, we'd like to invite you to a night of worship this Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. in the Worship Center. This will be a special night as we pray over the participants in our Idaho mission trip. This team of high school students and leaders will be leaving this Friday for a week of serving in Salmon, Idaho. Come worship with us and support this mission team's efforts. Also, if you're looking for a way to serve on Sunday mornings, we could use your help in our eKids ministry at 9.30 and 11 a.m. No experience is necessary, just the ability to love and care on our kids. So let us know if you're interested by going to followeastside.com slash kids. There are so many ways to get plugged in and we can't wait to partner with you in serving our Eastside community. Don't forget to interact with us in the comments below and let us know where you are watching from. If you have any prayer requests, you can reach out to us right here in the comments as well. Today, Pastor John will be continuing through his sermon series, The Parables of Jesus. So let's prepare our hearts to hear from the Lord today. Once again, thanks for joining us. Now let's worship together.
that's gonna be. And we all gather together again on the beautiful shore with the master himself. I love the words that this particular hymn writer wrote. It said, oh, that will be, it'll be glory for me when by his grace I shall look at his face. That will be glory for me. Will you sing with us? Oh, that will be glory for me. Welcome to our Sunday morning time in the Word of God. We're so glad you've taken the time to be with us for our worship through the Word of God as we make our way through the parables of Jesus. There are some 35 in Scripture. We are now at parable number 33. The series ends in just a few more Sundays, and I thank you for your participation. Thank you for your interest and your positive comments. Hope it's been helpful to you as we have looked at the parables of Jesus. And today we come to another parable of Jesus. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, or the Pharisee and the, the tax collector. The publican, the tax collector, was a public figure involved in collecting taxes in Israel, a Jew who was really an agent of Rome, despised by the public, but the publican was someone who was instrumental in making sure that uh, the, the government of Rome had the revenue to occupy appropriately uh, the, the nation of Israel during the days of Jesus. Now we find this parable in Luke's gospel. It's chapter 18. It's only about five, six verses. Join me there on the screen or your copy of the Word of God as we look together. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Now, the context is this. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Verse 10, <clears throat> two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or, <laughs> or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. And then there's a hinge, a comparison. Here's the side-by-side -side story. Jesus says in verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up into heaven and it says here that he, that he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then Jesus makes comment. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, that is the publican, the tax collector, compared to the other man, the Pharisee, 
I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, yes, this is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's a parable about two men who go into a temple to pray. And I think it's very, very clear here by what Jesus says is he wants to illustrate something that he is against. Jesus is illustrating that he is against self-righteousness. That is the idea that you can save yourself, give yourself eternal life, make yourself better by your own self, your own power, your own initiative, your own capacity that you have within yourself the ability to be right with God. And Jesus completely rejects that. Jesus resists that teaching. So he uses this parable about two men. These two men are on opposite ends of life's spectrum. They are on opposite ends of the ladder. One is a Pharisee in a religious country. That Pharisee is at the top of the religious food chain. He was a man who had daily rituals of prayer. He gave a tenth of his income to the work of God, quote unquote. He was in the old boys club of religious leaders. His life economically was set. His life status was set. His life path was set. He was a religious leader in a religious nation called Israel. And this one man on that particular aspect of the spectrum is a man who represents one particular attitude that Jesus teaches us in the parable. This is a man who is filled with self-righteousness. Throughout history, there have been people who have believed themselves to be righteous, righteous in their own worth, righteous in their own works, righteous in their own values. They believe that their righteousness, their self-righteousness is so strong that it will get them across the finish line when it comes to heaven. The idea is that if you are good enough, if that you try hard enough, that if you are sincere enough, then when you die, God will look on all the good you've done in your good self and will let you enter into heaven. Jesus draws a comparison here and doesn't reach that conclusion. I came across this illustration this week, and I thought this might be a good place for us to start for purposes of seeing how we all struggle with this same issue the Pharisee struggles with called self-righteousness. It's simply entitled the, the, The Other Fellow. Listen to this. It says, have you ever noticed when the other fellow acts that way, he is ugly? When you act that way, you're just expressing yourself. When the other fellow is set in his ways, he is obstinate. But when you're set in your ways, you are firm and convictional. When the other fellow doesn't like your friend, he's prejudiced. When he doesn't like him, when you don't like him, then you are of a a good judge of, of good human nature. When the other fellow tries to treat someone especially well, he's kissing up. When you do the same, you are being thoughtful. When the other fellow takes time to do things, well, well, he is a, he's a slowpoke, but when you take your time, you are deliberate and careful. When the other fellow spends a lot uh, of money, he is wasteful. But when you do the same, you are generous. When the other fellow picks flaws in things, he's critical. When you do, you're discerning. When the other fellow is mild mannered, you, you call him weak. When you're mild mannered, you are, you are gracious. When the other fellow dresses well, he is extravagant. When you dress well, you're tasteful, fashionable. When the other fellow says what he thinks, he is rude. When you say what you think, you are frank. Here we have a parable, a parable about a, about a Pharisee who, who continually compares himself to this other fellow. He sees himself this way, 
and on the same issues of life, he sees this tax collector, the other fellow, in a completely different way. And Jesus says both of these men, they go into the temple and they offer two different prayers. The Pharisee offers one kind of prayer and the other fellow, well, he offers another. The other fellow, he's bad. Me, myself and I, I'm good. I am righteous. There was the mentality within that Pharisee and it is the mentality of many throughout history, even today, who believe that they are something else, that they are righteous in their own person. You know, there are offshoots of that in today's Christianity. In fact, there always has been. I grew up personally, uh, I grew up in a legalistic Baptist Christianity, a legalistic brand of Baptist Christianity, uh, where things were defined as do's and don'ts, where your righteousness, your walk with God was defined by what you do and what you don't, where you go and where you don't go. It, it, it really was. I lived it. I, I, I know of that which I speak. In fact, I have friends who grew up in that Baptist stream like that, and I have other friends who grew up in the, in the, in the holiness stream like that. Uh, where they were defined by what they did and did not do, especially by what they did not do. It's true even today in some smaller circles that righteousness is defined by a dress code. Righteousness is defined by hair length. Righteousness is defined by musical styles. Righteousness is even defined one, by, by what version of the Bible you use. Righteousness, self righteousness. And there are still groups who still gather and believe those kinds of things. And if you press them on these issues, they will tell you that they are separated from this world, that they are righteous, and eventually they will get down to tell you that they are righteous by the things they do not do or the things that they do. Here is the Pharisee. One, one source of this self-righteous man that I read this week called the Pharisee delusional. He said he was delusional on three fronts. He was delusional about prayer. He used prayer in this parable for public recognition. He was delusional about himself. He fasted twice a week compared to the Jewish population. The Lord only required of them that they fast one day a year on the Day of Atonement. This man was delusional about fasting. He thought that fasting twice a week was going to gain him some righteousness. Look at me and how much I fast. Wow. And then he was delusional, says this commentator, about the publican, about the tax collector. He saw the tax collector as less than a human being than him. He was delusional. In fact, in every area of this man's life that's revealed to us here in this temple prayer, this Pharisee had it all wrong. Now, someone said this prayer of the Pharisee got no, no higher than the rafters of the temple. He thought he was talking to God, but when in fact he was, he was like a Shakespearean play, he was like a Hamlet or a soliloquy in a, in a Shakespearean in play. He thought he was talking to God, but in fact, he was just talking to himself. And while God has the ability to hear all prayers, he was not hearing in an answering manner and heart when he heard this particular man's prayers. We can be assured of that. This was a man that as he was, quote unquote, praying to God, he was looking down on others not aware of how much God was looking down on his self-righteousness. So this is the Pharisee. And this is the first attitude in this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He is in the temple area, this Pharisee, pious, righteous, better than superior, nobler, and he really is in this prayer, quote unquote, to God, he is honoring himself with degrees of greatness. 
And then in that same room, only just a few feet away, we presume by the text, there is this other fellow. And this other fellow is a publican. He is a tax collector. And he has a second and different attitude than the attitude of the, the Pharisee and the first attitude itself. The first attitude was self-righteousness, self-grandizement, self-glorification. But then we come to these verses, verse 13 especially, and we see the second attitude is a 180, completely different than the attitude of the Pharisee. The attitude is that of God be merciful to me, a sinner. I was reading a commentary by a late radio preacher who said this, the old publican, oh, he was a rascal. He was a sinner. He was as low as they come. When he sold his nation down the river, when he had become a tax collector, when he became a tax collector, he denied his nation. When he denied his nation as a Jew, he denied his religion. He turned his back on God. He took a one-way street never to come back to God. And why did he do it? It was lucrative. He said, there's money down this way. And he became rich as a publican. But it did not satisfy his heart. You can read the story of Levi. You can read the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, the next chapter over from this one. And we find that there those publicans' hearts, those tax collectors' hearts, were empty. The poor publican in his misery and desperation, knowing that he had no access to the mercy seat in the temple, cried out to God, direct your attention to verse 13. Would you please look at this very physical and emotional desperate cry to God. But the tax collector in verse 13 stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Someone may be asking in this service today, how do I approach Jesus for forgiveness and salvation? I tell you the truth, I think verse 13 is a great place to start, where you just simply say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, culturally, then and now, when you, when you beat your, your breast, that's a, that's a sign of emotion. And it expresses regret. It expresses remorse and mourning and sadness. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the physicality of this. It's the emotion of it. It's the deep spiritual brokenness of that. The late Bible professor J. Dwight Pentecost says of this man, quote, he wasn't asking God for clemency. He wasn't asking God to overlook sin. He wasn't asking God to change his attitude toward him. He was asking God to atone him, to make him right. To make him right. Because the publican knew unlike the Pharisee, that within him was no capacity to make himself right before God. In Bible terms, this idea of making yourself right, it's called propitiation. Propitiation. It's, a, it's an important word. It's a word that describes, if you will, the mercy seat of God a mercy seat that God provides for sinners. And that mercy seat is the lap of Jesus Christ. That when Jesus Christ went to the cross for our sins, it satisfied God the Father with where we were in standing with him, that we had separation because of sin, unable to save ourselves, unable to make ourselves right. Jesus Christ came to this earth sinless, became sin on the cross, died for our sins on the cross, took our place on the cross. He became the 
mercy seat, he became the propitiation, the satisfaction for my sin, for your sin, for our sins. You see, the publican realized, the tax collector got it right, that only Jesus Christ could take away his sins. But not only take away his sins, but be the propitiation, the satisfaction to take away the sins of the world. If you're a disciple of Jesus today, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you can look back on your life right now and discover and remember when you sat for the first time in that mercy seat. I'll never forget going to visit uh, television sets of talk shows where my son and son-in-law and their band would perform and they would sometimes pre-tape the talk show and I would have an opportunity to be on the set and I could sit in the, behind the desk and the, the seat of the famous host of the show. And I could just sit there and I, I remember it was a great moment. And later when I watched the shows, I would say, you know, I, I sat in that seat and I could remember it. That's very pale in comparison to when I was eight years old in a little town called Gardendale, Alabama, outside of Birmingham, where my dad was preaching a revival. It was a Thursday night. And I remember he gave an invitation, and in that revival service as an eight-year-old boy in 1966, in August of 1966, I realized my need for Jesus, and I went forward. I think God saved me with that first step. That was the step of faith. And I went forward, and my dad led me in a sinner's prayer. And I, for the first time, now as I look back theologically, doctrinally, practically, emotionally, that was the first time that I ever experienced the mercy seat of Jesus. I was able to sit in his lap and him to cover me, protect me, surround me by what he had done on the cross for me. He became the propitiation for my sin. And it was there where he took all of my sin that all of my self-righteousness was destroyed. It was there when I sat in the mercy seat as a kid and now as a, as a grown man for all those years in between, my self-righteousness is nothing. It can do nothing but frustrate others. My self-righteousness is in vain. There's nothing good in me to save myself, to forgive myself. And I, as a follower of Jesus, want to do good works and to serve others. But outside of Jesus, to do good works and to serve others, it's all in vain if Jesus is not the central driving force and the, the mercy seat, the center of all of that. He is the satisfaction. He is the propitiation for our sins. And then there's another doctrinal truth there that's so powerful in verse 14. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, that is the publican, the tax collector, he went home justified before God. So here is a doctrine of, of justification where God looks down on me and you through the finished work of Jesus Christ and sees us complete, sees us just as if we had never sinned because we're in the mercy seat covered by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. And when we say, God, be merciful to me, to sinner, forgive me of my sins, come into my life, Lord Jesus, that propitiation comes as a part of my life and I am justified doctrinally. I am forever forgiven. My position goes from being in sin to being in Christ and I am a new creation in him, so are you. This man was justified. He went home justified because he came on the basis of God and his power and forgiveness, not on the basis of his own self-righteousness. Your self-righteousness and mine will never save, will never forgive, will never be able to grant ourselves eternal life. Then there's this 
universal lesson in kingdom living found at the end of verse 14. That's a reminder to you and me when we are tempted to get prideful, when we are tempted to forget the grace of God in our lives and the lives of others, guilty. Here's a universal principle Jesus teaches here. He, he says in verse 14, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Anyone like the, the, the tax collector, John, or any of you, anytime that we exalt ourselves, oh, how great we are, we are a man or a woman who's heading for a fall. If we will exalt ourselves, how great we are, how wonderful, you, the, the narcissistic tendency in our, 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 our sinfulness and our flesh, it's still there. He says here, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. Then he goes on and says, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so here is the challenge for you and me, living life every single day as a husband, wife, spouse, parent, child, teen, employee, employer, if we will take on a spirit of humility and not be this arrogant, self-righteous, smartest person in the room type of person, if we will humble ourselves, God will exalt us. And I don't know what that means. Does that mean an exalted place? Because I, I, I don't know all the man manifestations of that. What I do know is that at least positionally and in his eyes, his favor, we are seen positively. If we will humble ourselves, the Bible teaches in due time, God will exalt us. And the ultimate exaltation, the ultimate placement of that exaltation will be when we go to heaven, not based on anything we did, but based on what Jesus did for us on the cross. So here's the question I want to ask you. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, your Lord? Time, place in your life, I wonder, do you have that? When you said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and live within me. Have you ever done that? I mean, meant it soberly, sincerely. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you have not, then like this tax collector and unlike this Pharisee, you can humble yourself and you can say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe Jesus rose three days later. I cannot save myself. God, please forgive me my sins. I receive Christ. I confess him with my mouth. I believe in my heart that Jesus lives. Now give me the power to live for you. If you pray that prayer, God indeed will forgive you. And you can become right now a child of the king. And you can be at home or go into your day as someone just like this man who went home justified before God. If you prayed that prayer with me, I sure do wish that you would respond to, to the email at the lower third of the screen. That's an email to me. Just simply write me and say, John, I pray to receive Jesus with you. And what I'd like to do is if you would send me your, your physical address, I'll send you a book as our gift to you about how to grow in your new life in Christ, how to grow in the word, how to grow in fellowship, how to grow in relationships, just how to begin to get into what it means to be a follower of Jesus on a daily basis. I sure do hope you'll do that. And I sure am glad that you have joined us this day as we have looked at the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Goodbye and God bless you. What a great time of worship. Thanks again for joining us today. Keep connecting with us online and sharing all that God is doing in your life. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and visit our website for more information on things going on throughout this week. 
We hope to see you next Sunday at 9.30 and 11 a.m. or 4 and 6 p.m. We love you, Eastside family. Hope you have a great week.